Cool. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's good to see a few returning characters and some new faces as well. Uh, I'm Professor Kaufman, and this is our second session in the Tool Time series. Uh, we're, our first session, if you didn't know, was recorded, and I posted my notes for that. And I will flash this up uh, just quickly over here uh, in the web browser. Uh, for those who might be seeing this the first time, z.umn.eu slash tool time, all one word. Uh, this will get you to that site. Uh, and if you're interested in what we're up to today uh, or what we did before, uh, you'll find that uh, those materials are available there at some uh, future point, along with the things that we're going to do in a couple weeks uh, upcoming. Uh, so tonight's session is supposed to focus a bit on Emacs again because it's a rather girthy program and has a lot of cruft in it that was worth discussing. Uh, last time we focused on just sort of basic ins and outs, uh, the fact that you have text displayed, uh, that keystrokes do certain things, that there are these mo major modes for editing. Uh, I realized after I finished that that there were about six or eight different things that I didn't get a chance to talk about that are very important. Uh, and so I'll try to post some short videos to sort of follow up on that. Like one of the things I forgot to talk about entirely, though it's in the notes, is, well, how do you get like multiple windows to open? Like how do I split the screen and stuff like that? Um, it's very possible uh, and very useful to do. We may touch on that just a little bit today. Um, with the customization sort of thrust in mind, uh, I just want to mention again uh, that Emacs is a somewhat difficult uh, program to sort of get your head around. Uh, and the series is in part there to try to surmount this difficult learning curve uh, that's associated with it. Uh, folks pop up the following graphic every now and then to talk about your standard podunk editors that your mom and your dad might use if they're not code savvy, uh, like Windows Notepad uh, and its ilk. And this has a very gentle learning curve because there's not much to it really. Uh, somewhat more program intensive editors like your Picos or your Nanos that you use on the command line, uh, they've got a little bit more girth to them, but most people find that they can figure things out pretty quick and get work done. Uh, your average Visual Studio, and in that I'd put your Eclipse and your NetBeans and maybe even some of your Atoms and your VS Codes these days, uh, have a bunch of niceties to them, uh, but generally you hit some peak and after a while things start getting in the way so you actually feel dumber as you use them. Uh, then you contrast those with your classic Unix editors, VI and Emacs, and they have very, very different characteristics. VI being almost impenetrable to learn for the first time, but once you get it, like you can scream along uh, at a high rate. An Emacs being something that, yeah, it's sort of easy to use the first time, and then you start discovering that you don't know all there is to know, and then you discover later on that, oh, I was doing this all wrong the entire time, and so you backtrack, and it has this weird sort of facet to it. We're gonna start to uncover why this spiral sort of shape exists here, or at least why people joke about it. It has to do with the fact that Emacs isn't actually under the hood a text editor, it's a programming language interpreter uh, that is meant to be programmed to do whatever it is that you want it to do. Uh, there's a semi-famous programming blogger uh, named Steve Yegi. Uh, he got his first big gig uh, at Amazon, I'm told, and apparently when he joined, all the customer service people at Amazon made use of a program to deal with customers that, you know, some customer would call up with a complaint to Amazon and the customer service rep would use a program to sort of deal with this. And he learned after a short time that this program was actually written in Emacs. So every time they fired it up, like their customer service app was uh, the Emacs text editor just molded into this shape that made it really easy. Uh, and he said they changed away from that to something else later on and he got screamed at at parties all the time. It's like, oh, you're on the development team. What happened to our customer service app? Like, it's terrible now. Bring back the old one. It's, it's way, way better. Uh, and he wanted to sort of talk about the history of Amazon as being this place where in their original source repositories, they had C code and they had Lisp code. Uh, and Emacs is sort of somewhere in between there. Uh, and then after they needed to hire hundreds and hundreds of engineers, and they couldn't find enough that knew Lisp and C, uh, they started hiring people that knew Java, so everything got worse as, as it went. So uh, that's anecdotal, uh, but uh, his, uh, his blog series, Stevie's Drunken Blog Rants, are well worth it for any programmer to spend a little time uh, perusing. Um, so anyway, uh, what's going to happen today in terms of our uh, agenda of activities uh, is I first need to sort of talk uh, to the crowd at large uh, that might be watching this video later just to offer some thanks uh, to folks that are making this possible. Uh, first, I have to thank again Joe Finnegan who is in the control booth. 
Joe told me that he has the flu today, and yet, uh, despite taking some time off work, he trudged in here and is back there to make the high quality production uh, that all of you online are viewing at the moment. I am eternally grateful to, to Joe for that, uh, so thank you. Uh, the computer science department uh, for paying me a you know, living wage uh, so that I can come into the classroom and especially uh, uh, have some time in the evenings uh, to talk to you folks about this. Uh, they've been very supportive in advertising uh, and uh, sort of paying my paycheck, as it were. Uh, the IMA, Institute of Mathematics, owns this room, and they've been kind enough uh, to let us use it. Uh, and then finally, there's the smattering of you folks who decided that uh, Tuesday nights, despite hot dates like uh, on the forefront, uh, is not a bad time to spend uh, talking about programming ins and outs. And so thank you for showing up. It'll give me a chance to slow down a little bit as you have questions. Uh, so I wanted to review one, just one moment uh, to talk uh, for, for a second, because this will preface us. Uh, this is a reminder that Emacs is a little weird in that uh, what you'll see on the screen up here, uh, via this little display here, are lots and lots of keystrokes uh, flying by. And understandably then, if you're watching a video, you may want to pause and sort of look at uh, the transactions that just happened. That's because most of what you can do in Emacs can be done on the keyboard, do its, do its history uh, as a program that developed before graphical units or interfaces uh, were really to the fore. Uh, so moving around, like going to next lines, you can get to control N and control P. And last time, in the last video, we talked about these weird conventions, like why is it control N to move down to the next line rather than open up a new file like every other program out there? Well, that's because uh, Emacs existed before most of those other programs, and it said, why should I change? You're the ones that suck. Um, so at any rate, uh, you'll see lots of keystrokes there. And key to our understanding today is to understand that as you would type a, a key like Control N uh, or Control F, uh, which moves forwards, what's actually happening is that key stroke is caught, and under the hood, the Lisp engine that's behind Emacs is running a command. Uh, it's a Lisp function of some sort that probably devolves down to some set of C calls, like at the very low level, but uh, we'll consider it at the Lisp level. Uh, and it's that Lisp function that we can sort of harness and customize in various ways uh, as we go forwards. So uh, equally what, as well as contriping control F, I could invoke the interactive command that's mentioned here. Uh, control F is equivalent to running the inter interactive command uh, forward character. Uh, so if I'm up here and I type in meta X, and this gives me a prompt down here in the mini buffer uh, to start executing uh, some interactive command. And I type in forward car, uh, then the little cursor that you see up here referred to in Emacs parlance as the point is gonna move forwards one character. Uh, and uh, th there we go. The uh, raw lisp for this is to invoke the function uh, forward character. And this is a keystroke that we'll use occasionally, uh, which is uh, the alt key, that's a uh, meta in Emacs parlance. You have to hold shift uh, and then a whole, uh, press the semicolon, but the shift will get you up to a colon. Uh, this opens up a little spot in the mini buffer to evaluate a Lisp code rather than an interactive command name. And here we'll have to use proper Lisp syntax, so my forward uh, uh, character. You can see I'm tabbing to try and autocomplete stuff. I have a lot of uh, possible possibilities there because there are a lot of forward movement commands in Emacs. Uh, so if I press enter at this point, uh, then uh, I'm not sure where it was. It's here now. I'm going to move forwards one character again. Uh, so everything that you do in terms of exotic keystrokes is really just running some code under the hood. And interestingly, you can get access to that code and uh, see what it looks like in many cases uh, and twist it around for other purposes. Uh, but we'll sort of get to that in, in line. Uh, with that brief reminder, I wanted to ask those who are here, who uh, might have been here last time or might have pressing issues associated with Emacs, if there are any questions before we get underway with this customization bit. Yeah, crickets. So uh, we'll just uh, move on with the prepared material. As usual, if you have questions, if they go too fast and you miss something, uh, just put your hand in the air, or uh, if in it's an emergency, you know, throw something at me, preferably something soft and non-valuable uh, to slow me down. Uh, for the moment, then, let's consider uh, the nature of customizations, uh, that we'd be running some commands, uh, and generally, then, those commands uh, you can access via keystrokes, you can access via interactivity, like this meta X, like do something, uh, uh, sorts of stuff down here. Uh, but there are a lot of things that you might want to customize that 
as Emacs starts up aren't there by defaults, and so the immediate question is, uh, if I do a bunch of customizations, how do I save them in a way that they'll be there next time I fire up Emacs? It's a program that's known to you know, run for months at a time. It's like, I have this Emacs open, and it's been three weeks since I closed it. Uh, but that still doesn't mean like uh, the next time I open it up, I wanna have to type in a bunch of things to sort of get it to look exactly as you see it up here, which is not the sort of standard way uh, that Emacs looks. Uh, if you download it and fire it up at home, you'll probably get something that looks uh, like this instead. Uh, with this obnoxious splash screen and this truly horrendous blinking cursor, which just drives me nuts. Uh, and so uh, uh, a sort of starting goal here is how do I get it to look uh, somewhat different than this uh, out of the box uh, so that I don't have to worry about this stuff, all this clutter with menu bars and stuff, uh, whereas mostly what I'm interested in doing is paying attention to text, so more room for text would be uh, desirable on that front. Uh, to that end, you'd want to acquaint yourself with one of the standard practices in programming, that if you offer a program to someone that can be customized in various ways, then it's typical to have some initialization file that the program would read on startup to tweak things ever so slightly. Uh, this is a long tradition in, I think, all computer systems, uh, but Unix has a particularly strong tradition of it. Uh, lots of Unix-centric programs like Emacs and Bash and Vim and uh, even the top interactive command to view uh, what programs are running, they have little initialization files that live in your home directory. Uh, and these usually start with a dot because the convention in uh, Unix is if it starts with a dot, it's a so-called hidden file. Uh, so it won't show up in a standard LS, uh, a listing of what's in the directory. Instead, you have to invoke it. Well, like, show me everything, including those little dot files. Uh, and they oftentimes end with this little RC, although Emacs is an exception there. Uh, I had to actually look this up. Uh, what does the RC stand for? It's uh, short for run commands, uh, as in uh, run these commands like when you start up. And typically, uh, the bashes and vims and the Emacs is the world. Uh, the nature of that initialization file is like to do a bunch of things, to carry out a bunch of activities. Um, now it's the, the case that I think uh, Emacs and Bash take this sort of to the extreme because both of those have a sort of built-in language that they understand. Uh, in Bash, this is the command shell so that as you would you know, type things in here like ls or for i in uh, sequence one to 10, uh, do uh, echo i, uh, done, uh, then you see uh, things on here. Um, this is a language that this command interpreter understands if it doesn't know what the command is and it tries to run it as a program. Uh, so the initialization files for these two, uh, Emacs and Bash, uh, is written in the language that they understand, so you can do pretty much anything you would do interactively right at the startup uh, to sort of tweak things uh, appropriately. Uh, on the other hand, your tops uh, and your vims uh, weren't really built with a programming language interpreter in mind. And so frequently what you'd see in those places is some set this variable to be equal to this value, set this variable to be equal to this value, and that's the all, all the customization that you get. Uh, a big part of the power that Emacs has then is in the ability to tailor everything using this built-in uh, Lisp programming interpreter uh, so that the commands that I run by typing keystrokes are also things I can program in sequence to define new functions uh, to do various things. Uh, just to underscore that, uh, here's my uh, home directory, as I'd upload up. Uh, if you list, that's fairly clean and so forth. Uh, you don't see any Emacs or Bash RCs in there, uh, but if I did an ls-a, which is uh, show me everything that's actually in there, you'll see all kinds of dot files in here, which are hidden uh, for Emacs and for Dropbox and uh, for various other things around here. Some of these are initialization files, others are sort of configuration for various programs, uh, but this is uh, sort of a large wealth of different things that you can potentially tailor, most of them tied particularly to an individual program. So far, so good? All right. So uh, the standard place then to put most of your customizations in Emacs is in your home directory in this little .emacs uh, file. Uh, and to give a, a sort of uh, look at that, I'll, I'll open my current .emacs up uh, in this editor, and you'll see it's completely empty right now because in preparation for this, uh, I want to start uh, various Emacs instances uh, on a clean slate so you can see as we customize, this changes the appearance in, in this way or that. My actual uh, .emacs I've uh, thankfully backed up here, uh, and it's uh, uh, you know like 1,500 lines long, uh, full of corrupt in there, uh, and just full of like all kinds of goodies, like it's basically a big program to like uh, initialize Emacs in various ways. 
If anybody is tremendously interested in my awful, awful looking uh, Emacs file, I'd be happy to provide it at a later time. Uh, but I'll pull out what I think are the best pieces of it for beginners uh, to sort of dissect uh, throughout this session as we go on. Is it making sense? <clears throat> okay, so then, uh, if you were going to sort of customize things uh, uh, at the, the outset, uh, then your basic set of uh, sort of preliminary get Emacs into a state that kind of reflects uh, usability by the, um, is follows something like the following. Uh, so we have an open instance of Emacs over here. Uh, it's doing this god-awful blinking thing, uh, which we're going to get rid of in just a second. Uh, but the first thing you might do in here is to try to get yourself some better completion. <laughs> Uh, we talked last time about in Emacs, you would open up files and switch between buffers uh, using sets of commands. Uh, and uh, right now, if I do the typical, like, let me open up a file, which is Control X and followed by Control F, and then you see down here in the bottom, I'm prompted for a file. Uh, I could open up some sort of a file, like uh, I have like an xyz.txt. Okay, I think there's one in there, and that's the only one, so I'll open this up. Uh, and there's uh, a bunch of stuff in here that are historical notes that I took a long time about, uh, about something else. Uh, you can see that this text file, like, it wasn't particularly easy to figure out like that it was in there, that I had to know it starts with x, y, and then I can start pressing tab and maybe get some completion. Uh, if I want to change to a different buffer, uh, for instance, uh, this is a control x and then b in Emacs, uh, and you can see down here I have uh, a suggestion of if you press enter right now, I'll go to the Emacs. But if I press tab, then I get some other things like there's a messages buffer and a scratch buffer, so I can change the scratch and, and I'll be fine. And this is just some default buffer that's open. Uh, this is sort of piddly. I mean, it doesn't give me very good completion or suggestions for anything. And so a typical customization right off the bat is to enable I do mode. And it escapes me exactly what I do is for, uh, but uh, it's tremendously useful. Uh, if I fire this up now, uh, which is meta X here, it's an interactive man, and type I do mode, uh, then you'll see a little report here that it's been enabled. And this time, if I look for a file, uh, then I get suggestions uh, down here. Uh, and if I would type something like, uh, I don't know, WNLO, uh, which is not the beginning of the file, let me move this up just a little ways, uh, WNLO, uh, I'm still gonna get the suggested, oh, this matches in the middle of downloads, which is a big improvement over your standard uh, Emacs uh, matching uh, bit of business. Uh, and so uh, this I do mode works both for files, it works for buffers. You can see here I have uh, buffers, and you know the right keystrokes, uh, control S in this case. You can scroll between these without much uh, 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 need. Uh, so for instance, uh, scratch here, I don't need to preface it with the right things. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm good to go on that front. So I do mode uh, generally is a tremendously useful uh, thing to be there. Right now, as I start up Emacs, uh, it's not uh, the case that this is enabled. Uh, and so I, if I wanted it enabled, uh, the easy steps are to plop down some code in my .emacs that will fire that thing up as soon as this Emacs starts. Uh, so I'll do so. Now uh, here, uh, find .emacs, which is an empty text file, and this should just be I do dash mode. Uh, and the list version of this, you can see I get some completion down here, uh, takes an optional argument. I'm going to pass in one, uh, which means to enable it if it's not enabled uh, otherwise. I save this thing. Now I'm going to quit Emacs, Control X, Control C. Uh, that closes down. Uh, I'll fire it up one more time. Uh, so here's my blank Emacs. Uh, and up here then, if I do the Control X, Control F, I have the nice auto completion here, uh, for instance. Uh, if I type that WNLO, uh, it gets me into downloads and I'm good to go on that front. Making sense? So this is going to be our basic cycle uh, to customize Emacs is I decide oh, I want it to be like this uh, and then take some of the code that will enable that to happen, plop it down in .emacs uh, and potentially restart it, although there are some uh, sort of shortcuts that we'll get to in just a second on that front. Questions so far about what you've seen? Nope, cool. So then, here is my short list of things that I'd encourage you all to enable right off the bat uh, that they're, they're, they're worthwhile. I do mode is one of them. Uh, I've already alluded to the fact that I cannot stand the blinking cursor, uh, and so you can disable that uh, with the following little invocation. Uh, show paren mode is good. As you would see here, I have a parenthesis on the right-hand side. It's highlighting over here the matching parenthesis on the left-hand side. This isn't done, I think, by default in Emacs, but uh, 
this little bit of code in your .emacs will enable that. Uh, there's a mode in Emacs that will, whenever a file changes on disk, perhaps by another program, uh, Emacs will automatically reload it. Uh, if you're running test cases and observing some file that has a result for that test case in it, uh, this is a terribly useful one to have on. Uh, column number mode just puts down here uh, next to the uh, line number or the row number or column number as well. Uh, so as I move forwards, you can see it going to 14 and 15 and so forth. Uh, and this global HL mode, uh, this is what uh, makes this cursor a little bit, uh, or the line that the cursor is on a little bit gray. Uh, if I disable that, it can be a little bit harder uh, to see exactly where the cursor is if your eyes stray, uh, so I tend to keep that on. Uh, that's one I learned from watching YouTube videos at some point, uh, so you'll see lots of these. Uh, I didn't know what the command was, I just saw, how did he do that? Like there's this cool little thing on there, and so you Google around for a little bit until you find stuff like that. Uh, some slightly more esoteric uh, customizations that you might want to look for. Uh, I hate it that the um, line wrapping on Emacs is such that it's not truncated. And I can uh, demonstrate that in our default one over here. If I make this thing sh uh, sort of slimmer, as it were, uh, you can see that this line uh, is wrapped around down here. And I find that to be terribly sort of frustrating on the eyes, uh, that I just don't like the fact that this is one line, but it's now occupying more real estate. I don't care that this is uh, cut, would be cut off. And so the customization here to truncate at the end is uh, uh, sort of worthwhile. And to demonstrate that, I'll copy this, jump over here in this Emacs, uh, and fire up down here. You can see in the bottom left, I've uh, invoke that uh, meta colon again in order to pull up an eval uh, buffer. And if I yank this thing in, uh, then you'll see this becomes a more sort of nice like layout with a little arrow here to indicate that this is a truncated like at this point. Uh, if you want to actually see it, well, just make your display a little bit bigger on that front. But usually I don't care to see it if it's uh, that far over. Sensible so far. Okay. Uh, the other things that I <laughs> I sort of insist on doing is turning off all the extraneous stuff, like toolbar, the menu bar, uh, and the scroll mode, uh, bar mode. Uh, in turn, this will be toolbar mode. Uh, so we'll toggle that off. And you'll see up here this little um, sort of bunch of icons that are colorful and playful, but otherwise useless. Uh, that goes away. Uh, your menu bar mode. Uh, goodbye, file, edit, options, etc. Like who needs you, everything's on the keyboard anyway. Uh, and even this little scroll bar is kind of useless uh, if I know down here I have a percentage of some kind or I'm seeing the whole thing. So scroll bar uh, mode, uh, forget it. Uh, the few other things uh, that you can turn off, for instance, this little space right here that Emacs sometimes put annotations in is called the fringe, and you can disable that as well. That I usually do because I maximize real estate on that front and don't find it to be particularly useful. Uh, but uh, other than that, then uh, a few other things like turning off the startup screen uh, and putting your own scratch message in the scratch buffer are not bad. Uh, before I get to the question, let's just take this whole thought then. We'll copy it here. <clears throat> Uh, I will come over here, find that uh, dot, dot emacs, uh, no, I don't have it, uh, dot emacs, uh, copy the lot of it in here, uh, save this thing, close it down, control C, and restart emacs, and uh, there you have it. Uh, I have now uh, so, uh, the sort of line highlighted with that HL line, and all of the extraneous stuff, or at least in my opinion, extraneous stuff uh, removed from it. Now, this is to say nothing about what you want to do because having a menu up here uh, is not a bad thing for uh, folks who are new to it, and it gives you some ideas of uh, how you might mouse over and discover some things. But eventually, most long-time Emacs users have no use for it up here. Particularly, this thing can be present in the terminal, but you can't click on it, so it's not particularly worthwhile to have there. Uh, and to that end, uh, most folks uh, get rid of it at that point. Sir, you had a question that was burning. Uh, yeah. That? So all these modes uh, come with Emacs by default. You do not need to download or program anything. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll talk about this mode business sort of as we move forwards. Um, they fall into sort of two different categories. One of them here you're observing affects in some way the global display of information. Uh, in this case, whether or not you see menus or toolbars or stuff. 
Uh, the other kind of mode is typically associated with editing a certain kind of file. Uh, and as we discussed in our last session, uh, there are modes to edit C files and Java files and all sorts of other programming languages, OCaml and Clojure and all the other goodies like that. I haven't yet met a programming language that doesn't have some sort of Emacs mode that is tailored to editing that kind of file specifically. And what you'd expect when you go into one of those programming modes is it would highlight the syntax right, it would have certain indentation rules that were associated with it, and it would probably even bind some keys in a certain way that seemed appropriate to that mode. Uh, but we also, uh, it's possible to see some modes that do things aside from programming. Uh, for instance, uh, typical keystroke control XD uh, to fire up the directory editor uh, puts you in a mode that's designed to list the contents of directory and make changes to them. Uh, for instance, I could go in here uh, and uh, press enter to go into this directory, which will get me in here. And I press caret to go up a directory. Uh, I can get rid of this uh, file by typing D, which will mark it for deletion, and then X uh, to delete all the files. And I'll say yes down here, and that goes away. Uh, I can even put this in a mode where I can rename things, like uh, Control X Q uh, changed me out of read only mode, so I can rename this uh, directory Apollo Dir, uh, and then type keystroke, and that will actually rename it uh, properly. Uh, so generally, these modes then are specific to some purpose. Uh, in this case, it was editing a directory as if it were a text file. Uh, and in other cases, it's uh, editing some program data or interacting with a shell or something like that. Uh, but the modes then are a bunch of list code that runs to tailor the experience in Emacs in this little buffer uh, down here to whatever it is it's supposed to be doing. Make sense? Do you download the code from online, or does it come with the? Yeah, everything we've seen so far uh, comes out of the box. Like everything I'm doing here is out of the box. Like it's there in Emacs. You don't have to download anything. We will talk in a little while about where you can easily download stuff. Uh, but it's not uncommon to just go out there and say, like Stack Overflow, how do I do X, Y, or Z on Emacs? Find a little bit of list code like this, and then copy it in your .emacs, and suddenly it behaves a little bit differently. Uh, that is the long tradition of Emacs, but it's become more formalized uh, these days because folks want an easier way to manage that stuff, and so they'll have packages uh, that are managed under a package manager uh, that you can download as well. Make sense? Cool. Uh, did I detect something over here? Nope. Okay, just uh, general interest in uh, uh, column sorting. Uh, so uh, this is more or less how we uh, our dot .emacs looks at the moment. Uh, we have some basic customizations uh, in it uh, to change appearance. Uh, and uh, I'll sort of try and take these at GASP and I'll plop them down online as well so folks can copy in. You don't have to be madly writing things down in here. Uh, should go up on the website in, in a, uh, after the presentation is done uh, over the next couple of days. Now, uh, as you would make changes in a .emacs file, your options are to restart or to actually take the code that you're plopping down in uh, .emacs and execute it in the running uh, system. Uh, so to that end, it's worthwhile to talk just a little bit about the way you can dynamically execute code. Uh, and certainly this is a possibility we've seen that anything that is a valid Lisp expression, if you type that keystroke meta colon down here, uh, then you can punch something in here, uh, like I could type uh, menu bar mode one, uh, which will plop that uh, irritating like menu bar to, uh, uh, back up and get rid of that, uh, or zero to, to turn it off. Uh, but Emacs has built-in support to take this text that's in this file or buffer uh, and actually execute it in the context of Emacs as you go through. Uh, so for instance, uh, over here, uh, as I have this little instance of Emacs running over here, uh, if I decided, actually I, uh, I have this menu bar up here that I don't want to go, so let me rerun this code associated with it. Get my cursor position right, and uh, Control Alt and then X uh, will execute the Lisp expression that's under uh, the point at the moment, uh, just where my cursor is, and you'll see that thing go away uh, instead. If I decide uh, that I actually like scroll bars in, in that uh, regard, uh, then I might uh, scroll over this thing and bring them back, uh, or uh, toggle it uh, by uh, turning its uh, back off like this. Uh, and if I want the toolbar mode, uh, the other one is if you're beyond the Lisp expression, you can see I've got that little parentheses highlighting here. Uh, control X, Control E will execute uh, the code that's before it. Uh, and so uh, that's yet another mechanism. If you want to evaluate the entire buffer uh, along those lines, is in turn these things all back on. 
as such. Uh, then there's a list function that will do that for you, disk medx eval buffer. I don't think out of the box there is a uh, key binding for this, uh, but down here it's an interactive command, so medx and then run it, uh, and you'll see like all the, th the things that are in this buffer be executed from top to bottom uh, to uh, make changes to the state of things. Uh, if, and finally, if you have some other file that you have some list code in, uh, you can uh, down here say load file uh, and uh, press enter, and this will prompt down here for loading some other uh, Emacs list file that's on disk, and it will evaluate in this uh, presently running Emacs instance, potentially changing the appearance of things. Uh, I do that from time to time. Uh, for instance, if I loaded the .emacs.bk, which is that backup file, uh, uh, emacs.bk, uh, then this will execute my actual .emacs uh, uh, and turn it into how it sort of normally looks uh, uh, for me along those lines with colorations and other stuff along those lines. Um, I think it's worth dwelling on this style of stuff uh, for a moment just to uh, reflect that this used to be how list programming was generally done, that folks would have some list engine that was present someplace and then some file they're editing. And they're like, I don't like the way this function is working or it has a bug in it. Uh, they wouldn't shut list down and recompile it and reload it. They would just take the one function, make some tweaks to it, and then reload it into the list system. Uh, and then in the list system itself, like mess around with it to see if it's working right. Uh, this is very much reflected in how we'll do some tailoring with Emacs. As you can see, like I can turn things on and off, uh, and it's dynamically sort of evaluating code along those lines, and so very, it's very easy to interact with in that way. There's a long tradition of having sort of live systems and then be able to say, oh, I've got everything just the way I want. I can ship it now to a customer. And List was known to have this uh, facility uh, built into it. Uh, that said, your modern programming environments like your Pythons and your Javas and so forth are a little bit less inclined in that direction. But anything that has sort of an interactive loop associated with it oftentimes has Emacs support to do similar things here. Uh, for instance, if you have a Python interpreter open uh, and have some Python code associated with it, there are keystrokes in Emacs will say, oh, here's your Python code, you have one function, send it over to the Python interpreter uh, and redefine that function so you can make a tweak on that. Uh, and this gives a very sort of interactive quality to it that you don't have to bop out to a shell and restart a bunch of stuff to see if your code works. You can just uh, try it on the fly as you go. Make sense? Cool. It's a different sort of like a, a beast entirely uh, compared to what the sort of the typically associate with your compile, uh, debug, uh, edit, and then recompile phases. Uh, the other major thing, aside from appearance, and we'll get to colors later because colors are a huge pain in the rear, uh, but the other major thing that you'll probably want to customize to some extent uh, is the key bindings that uh, Emacs makes available to you. Uh, there are a couple built-ins, uh, global set key and local set key, that allow you to take a keystroke uh, and overwrite whatever it was doing to run some new interactive list uh, command instead. Uh, for instance, if I want to be pernicious, uh, and I'll Let's see, yeah, we'll save that, uh, and I'll reload it. There's Emacs. Uh, if I wanted to be pernicious uh, up here, I could, uh, as I have it right now, Control F moves me forwards one character. Uh, I could uh, instead rebind this as a global set key. Uh, here's Control F, and it will uh, move uh, backwards, uh, move car. Backwards, oh come on, move, let's see, oh, sorry, uh, backwards car, sorry, I meant to, backwards car. Uh, so whereas most folks would usually expect this to move forwards, it's, it's now moving uh, backwards along those lines. Uh, I would strongly dissuade you from like engaging in such shenanigans uh, and uh, as you would expect something like control C to copy and control X to cut and so forth, uh, you might instead look around for some major modes that reflect those key bindings rather than trying to rebind them yourself. Uh, but there are a few ones that I think are worth suggesting uh, to, to change out of the box that are sort of globally oriented. 
and we'll get to customizations based on I'm editing C code or I'm editing Java code or I'm editing a make file. We'll get to those customizations that are specific to a type of thing in just a moment. Uh, here are some suggestions for global rebindings uh, that I have found over time to be tremendously useful. Uh, the default Emacs binding to change between windows, and the window here is uh, as I have uh, uh, over here, uh, see dot vac uh, a file here, and then maybe split this thing. Uh, so I'll have a uh, start a shell here. Uh, these things that, that are split here are referred to in Emacs as windows. Uh, so window on the left, window upper right, window uh, bottom right. You can certainly use your mouse to sort of click around on that, that front. But the default binding in order to move between them using the keyboards is Control X and then O to move to another one, uh, Control X O. Uh, the fact that I move between these so often uh, gave me great irritation uh, early on. And so I don't know what meta O was bound to before, but for me now it's uh, to flip between windows. Um, if you like, you can probably tweak and find some way to like, oh, go backwards. But usually I have only three or four open and it's faster just to jam this until I'm on the one that I want uh, in most cases. Uh, this is sort of the basic equivalence that uh, Emacs has to having like sort of two tabs open and, and flipping between them. Although the buffer mechanism to be able to quickly say uh, change over to something else like a work log, uh, that is a, a sort of fast way to change around if you knew what's open. Uh, and finally, if you forget what's open, then you can call up uh, a list of here are all the open buffers uh, that I'm uh, potentially able to, to mess around with. So that meta X uh, or meta O business uh, to switch between uh, windows is I think a, a really good one to have. I'm compiling code all the time, so I tend to set uh, some global key bind to be compiled because irrespective of where I am, if I want to run the stuff that's associated with the make file to do the various things, uh, then I'll want a key binding for that. And you can see this pops up down here, some command to run in a compilation buffer. Uh, make file in this case, although you could GCC some uh, program like x.c as well. Uh, and the nice part about that compilation business is that it will pop open a buffer with the results of it, and if there are any errors, let you jump between the errors in your source files as well. That's mentioned in the last session, uh, in case uh, yeah, you guys are curious. Uh, there is this uh, business here of automatically wrapping text uh, that uh, Emacs calls autofill mode. Uh, so for instance, if I open up a little thing here and started typing uh, lorem ipsum, blah, 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 uh, eventually, whenever I hit some column over here, uh, Emacs is going to start wrapping around automatically for me on uh, some sort of a word boundary. Uh, and this is great at times and irritating at others because it's highly likely uh, in some files that I want to be able to write off long lines uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and to that end, I have a little binding that will toggle that uh, back and forth. Um, as I would type, in my case, a control C and then L, you'll see down here, Autofill mode has been disabled, so if I keep typing here, it just keeps on going. Uh, and if I turn it back on uh, and then start uh, typing again, I'll automatically get wrapping along those lines. Um, so to that end, since I'm either writing code or writing text, some of which needs to be wrapped, some of which doesn't, uh, this is a, a useful one to have. Uh, the rest of these I don't want to dwell upon for too long, but replacing strings is really nice. Uh, joining lines, as in I want to take these lines and join them back together uh, quickly. Uh, that's not a binding that's out of the box. Uh, this one, for those of you who are involved in Git, may be useful to know uh, that Emacs has a robust interface to Git that can automate a lot of things, like uh, I want to have a commit message and I want to have a, open up a buffer to write that commit message, uh, then Magit is probably your go-to there. I use that fairly frequently, so I rebound it to control XG. Uh, for instance, uh, if I come into a project directory, uh, here's 2021, and I go over to the projects and my solution for this thing right now. Uh, I can press control XG uh, to see right now what is the uh, current setup in terms of what have I modified and what I haven't. Uh, I should probably stage all of these things, so I'll stage them there. They're staged, that's a C and then C uh, to commit it. And my message is, uh, let's see, comment, 
this later because I don't exactly know what what happened there. Another control C and control C commits that, so my git like repository now has reflected that change with an awful awful log message on, on that front. Uh, but all that was Emacs interacting with a subsystem in this case Git uh, and making a workflow somewhat easier than having to come over to the command line. Uh, let's see, let's see here. Come over to the command line and get uh, status and get, uh, let's see, commits, or get, uh, crap, I, see, I don't even remember what, the, what, what is it where you stage it? Who knows, the, who knows Git? Get add. get add, thank you, get add, okay, there it is. Uh, get add, whatever you change, and then get commit with uh, some sort of a message like a blah, blah, blah. See, Joe says he's sick, but, here he's like popping out to, to fill us in on like Git stuff and like. <laughs> All right. Um, so at any rate, um, it gives you some sort of idea then of like uh, uh, Emacs interface uh, possibilities. Certainly, Git is its own like a beast, uh, and understanding then the interaction between those two is worthwhile. Uh, but this gives you an idea then of uh, some possibilities in terms of tailoring behavior. Here's something I do really often. Uh, I want a keystroke to do it, like rebind away. Uh, and taking this stuff, uh, copying it into your .emacs file means every time you start it up, then Emacs has this set of capabilities right at your fingertips, literally, on that front. Uh, any questions about the, that part thus far? Yeah, sir. Kind of unrelated question, but uh, when I have a terminal open, uh, commands don't run in the terminal, like if I'm trying to switch between buffers, is that something I can get around? Let's see, so I need to understand that uh, in some more detail. So let me come over to a, a default Emacs, and if I do the MetaX shell, uh, then I get a shell like here, like this guy. Ah, okay, so um, my strong suggestion is use shell for now. Um, this behaves uh, as some weird hybrid between an actual terminal and an Emacs buffer. Uh, to demonstrate that, if I type ls right now, I get a listing. Uh, only uh, if I change this guy over to something else, so not get distracted there. Uh, and uh, if I use common Emacs moves so like Control P to go up, I can actually go up and like copy the stuff that's in here. Uh, and if you're worried about history, uh, then meta p will recall history in the shell. I generally find this one to be uh, somewhat easier uh, to use and more flexible because you can move around and copy things that, that, that uh, came out of here. Uh, there is this term alternative uh, that, that you stumbled upon. Uh, and this one is meant to emulate an actual terminal editor uh, or a, a terminal experience more. Uh, so as I type ls uh, here and try and uh, press control P, uh, what I get is the standard sort of bash behavior going back and uh, up. Uh, I think there are some ways to sort of move around, but they're not as convenient. Uh, and importantly, to get out of this one, uh, I think Control X doesn't actually work in here, so you can't change uh, out of it. Like uh, there's some other keystroke that you have to, to, to make use of to, to get out of there. Uh, so usually I just uh, kill this thing uh, at some point to uh, exit it, uh, and then I can get my normal key, max, uh, key bindings back. So strong recommendation, use shell here. Uh, now what you lose in this shell is that uh, terminal-based applications like Vim, well, I don't know why you'd want to run Vim in a subshell of Emacs, but that don't matter. Uh, but more importantly, things like Top uh, don't run because they took over the entire terminal and mess with the display in some ways. Uh, so as I would type Top in here, uh, you would probably see, uh, well, actually I have a bunch of customizations associated with, oh, mm, uh, oh yeah, I have a bunch of customizations associated with this to actually get it to run in, in a certain way, Emacs. But normally we just like barf and say, no, I can't do it. Uh, that's what, uh, I'm put this thing, uh, what Vim would do, uh, it would you know, give you some like crap along these lines. Versus, uh, 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 now I, did I, did I get, okay, good, okay, I actually did it. Um, in term itself, uh, this more robust terminal ed ed emulator, uh, then you probably can get top to run in there and take over the terminal if this other Emacs wasn't constantly stealing from it later. Does that make, make sense? <clears throat> Okay, cool. Um, so favor shell until you uh, get your head around that stuff a little, little bit more. Uh, okay, uh, just exit. Good. Other questions or concerns at the moment? Not so much, okay. Uh, just a couple notes about uh, this stuff. 
Uh, you'll see up here the use of some interesting syntax, and we may have a chance to round about to it. Uh, up here, the global set key, this is our first sort of introduction to a Lisp function proper. Uh, the function names in Lisp always go first, uh, usually crouched around with a parenthesis. And then what remains are arguments to it. And one notable thing here, uh, certainly this guy is a string constant of some kind, uh, but uh, one notable thing is this use of quotes here, which are a long tradition in Lisp and its related languages. Uh, this suspends execution or otherwise creates a symbol in this case. In this uh, situation, other window is the name of a function, and that's what I want to be bound to the, uh, this keystroke, is uh, the name of some function to run. Uh, there are two syntaxes uh, to suspend execution like this. A single quote like this, that's what's below the double quote next to the enter key on most keyboards. And the special form in uh, Lisp, which is, uh, looks sort of like a function quote, but the fact that it's highlighted in purple here should give you an indication that it's not quite like a function, it's actually sort of special. It means everything between these parentheses, suspend it for a moment. Uh, we may have a chance to sort of talk about that a little bit, but uh, Lisp is this interesting uh, world in which you can talk about when this code is compiled, like do the following stuff, uh, but this quote will actually suspend that compilation and uh, potentially evaluate it later at runtime instead. Uh, so knowing what's going to be evaluated as you compile and what's going to be evaluated as you run uh, is a sort of interesting uh, bit that you don't get in many other programming environments. It's a long story and probably would occupy a whole semester-long class, uh, but unfortunately I don't think we teach any classes that talk about that, that bit of business. The closest we get is like our 2041 advanced programming principles, but uh, I don't think that uh, macros and suspended ex execution is a really big part of that. Certainly symbols, though. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that uh, there are a couple ways uh, that you can state key bindings. Uh, the one that's demonstrated up here, which is just little strings, uh, that's fairly common, uh, somewhat old school, I think, at this point. Uh, there's another way that you'll uh, see that can be automatically generated where this uh, caret C business isn't actually the character's caret C, it's a single control character. So if I move forward by one character, this is all one big thing. Uh, we'll see in a second, this is how Emacs encodes it internally, and you can get access to that. And then finally, if you read about in the manual, like, oh, there's some keyboard, like a uh, keystroke that would do something, uh, there's a little keyboard thing here that would take a string that looks like this and convert it to some internal representation that's useful uh, to Emacs. You'll see this popped out every now and then or, uh, or as a nice way uh, to convert manual entries, our discussions. But all of these, in this case, are equivalent uh, to one another. Uh, now, I want to take just a moment uh, as an aside to uh, sort of point out that there is some amount of self-description uh, present in Emacs uh, so that if you do something interactively, like I do mode, uh, and you don't know exactly what the right way to call the Lisp code is, uh, there is a way to ask on that front. Uh, that if you do something like interactively, uh, then the following very esoteric key binding, control X, escape, escape, will recall in the mini buffer, this is the last thing that you did and opt you to repeat it. Uh, mostly I use that not for repeating, but for saying the last interactive thing I did was the Lisp code that's associated with that. Uh, allow me to demonstrate uh, over here. Uh, we have this I do mode, uh, which will uh, toggle it on and off. Uh, I'll do that one more time to make sure it's on. If I type that keystroke, control X and then escape, escape, uh, then you'll see this redo pops up, and what's given to me is not the interactive command, but the Lisp code uh, that was executed along those lines. So if you know how to do something sort of on the fly but with the interactive like portion of this, but don't know exactly the way to invoke the Lisp function itself, uh, then this can be a way to do it. <clears throat> so I just copied this code in here uh, with uh, copying and then grab here. Uh, and then maybe pop it down in uh, my .emacs file here, uh, like uh, this. Uh, although in this case, I'd probably want to find out in uh, I do mode, how do I turn it on definitively on, on that front. It seems right now that my little screen key thing has bar broken, so let me just restart that quick. Click here, uh, screen key, and then we're back. Good, okay, cool. Uh, so. The last part of this in terms of understanding functions, I just want to mention quickly is that Emacs is a, a self-documenting editor and that it has a very robust built-in help uh, set of features. There are a whole bunch of control H uh, commands to get help on various things, uh, but I think first and foremost, you might want to know what's bound to certain keys. Uh, so the keystroke control H 
uh, and then K uh, will uh, prompt for you to do something on the keyboard uh, or via mouse clicks or something like that. So I do something like compress control F uh, and this will pop open a little buffer down here that says control F is bound to this command, uh, forward character. Uh, and here's how the lift code goes for that. Uh, as in forward character, uh, you can call it with no arguments or you can call it with an optional number of arguments. Uh, to demonstrate up here, if I ran the list code forward character and then 10, uh, voila, I move forwards uh, 10 characters along those lines. If you want information on a function, uh, for instance, global set key, uh, then the keystroke control H and then F will search for uh, global functions. And here's something I just love about Emacs. It's already looking at, oh, your cursor was over this thing. Uh, let me suggest that that's actually a function I know about. And so if you just press enter at this point, I'll pull up the help menu for that thing. Uh, so pressing enter gives me the global set key and uh, various ways to bind it, uh, in, including down here uh, quite a bit of information uh, about where uh, I could go for sort of bindings along those lines. Um, if you're terribly Oh, never mind. Uh, if you're terribly curious, uh, you can actually look at the source code for this. It's linked up here, and pressing enter on this little .l, uh, Emacs Lisp file, uh, will pull that up so you can see the definition of here in Emacs Lisp uh, is how that function is de defined. Uh, you'll see down here the buffer is actually a zipped file, and it's in some global location that I probably can't edit, but I can at least look at the code. And this will become important as you want to develop more and more tailoring of customizations. Uh, you can look at all the Emacs source code in Lisp uh, yourself to sort of get ideas about what's present, how things are done in the standard uh, sets of stuff, uh, and otherwise extend your knowledge by observing what others have done. We'll come back over to that .org uh, file. Uh, all right, so um, this set of global key bindings business is not particularly, well, there's some danger in that as you customize things at the global level, uh, you might overwrite something that on a local level would be useful. Uh, so it's typical to not put everything in one spot as like globally set this, globally set this, but instead to tailor certain things uh, so that you would, when editing C code, have a certain set of key bindings that are appropriate to the C code. Uh, when you'd be editing uh, in the shell, for instance, uh, have a different set of key bindings that's appropriate to there. Uh, generally, the hierarchy of what's customized either by you or by the major modes for editing those things uh, goes with anything that you just press, like the letter A uh, or the number two, is probably not something you want to override. Uh, sometimes major modes do it. For instance, we've seen in directory editing mode, uh, if I come over here, uh, typing the character P does not insert P, instead moves to the previous uh, uh, line. Uh, but that makes sense in this context because I don't, I, I'm not supposed to like put characters in this directory and instead I'm supposed to move around and change files along those lines. Uh, although in a different mode I can do that uh, with these directories. Uh, versus things that are control F or control uh, G or uh, meta B or those sorts of uh, immediate commands are often used for movement and sometimes overridden by major modes, but generally uh, avoid it somewhat as you're customizing your stuff. Where you get most of your mileage is in uh, the control C uh, uh, realm, and this is sort of defined by Emacs as generally user customization, start with a control C and then some other key. Uh, so you notice a bunch of my uh, bindings like changing uh, the whether or not the uh, Emacs is going to wrap words for me or not, uh, control C L uh, over here, uh, that's bound to uh, one of those control C uh, prefixes, uh, control C C to make, uh, et cetera, along those lines. Uh, so if you're going to do a fair amount of global customization, uh, this is where it will be. And you'll see that the major modes, C in Java and uh, Shell and so forth, they override things both that start with a control X and a control C and to a limited extent uh, some of these other ones uh, down here. Uh, you can see in major modes what the typical key bindings are by asking for documentation about the mode. Uh, that's control H and then M. In this case, the file that I'm looking at here is an org mode, uh, and you can see uh, here's what org mode it means. Uh, and down a little bit lower, there are a bunch of key bindings uh, that are common to it. 
Uh, a lot of these are overrides that are org-centric of your standard stuff like kill a line while org has a special way that it wants to do that. So it'll still uh, eliminate the text and move it into the uh, kill ring, uh, but we'll do it with some sensitivity to the org uh, syntax in this case. Uh, but looking at a major mode uh, like C mode or Java mode and seeing the key bindings there is a good way to get a prize to what that mode can do for you. Um, if you want to tailor on a per mode basis, Emacs has what's referred to as hooks uh, in, embedded in it. And you'll see this elsewhere uh, in programming. It's usually a spot where you can hang some code, as if we're on a hook, so that when conditions arise, that code actually gets rung. Uh, I'll sort of walk through what you see here, uh, and then we'll see its actual effects in a second. I tend to want, as I would edit a directory, uh, the following things to be true. That some files, like files that start with a dot, or files that end in a tilde, which are Emacs backup files, I don't want to see those uh, because they're just not pertinent to like my day-to-day -day activities. But I would like to be able to toggle in between like seeing them and not seeing them because occasionally I want to delete a lot of them uh, or open up some hidden file or something along those lines. Um, so here's a way that you can affect that. Uh, it's not that I would want some global setting for the key H here. It's just when I'm editing directories, I want that to happen. And it's not that I'd want to hide everything that starts with a dot uh, ever, only when I'm editing directories. Uh, and so this directory mode, uh, dured mode hook, uh, is a spot that some code is going to be looked for so that when you would open up a directory, uh, this code is going to be run. And you'll see here uh, a very important concept that shows up all over in Lisp and used to be sort of uh, prime when it came uh, to computer science. Uh, it's the notion of a lambda. Uh, and I won't do this very much, but I know I have some very talented computer science students in here. Where have you seen lambdas or heard about them before? <laughs> Yeah, TA for 2041? No, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, and what what is a lambda? <laughs> I think it's a perfect way to do that. Here is anonymous nameless function. Uh, that, that, that's good. Uh, and it's a bit of a head scratcher, like when you sort of consider in your normal programming, is when would I ever use a nameless function? Like what good is that? And here is a prime example of where it's good. It's like I don't care to give this activity a name. I just want it uh, to be run whenever this dured uh, mode starts up. Uh, that I'll put a hook in here. Uh, the other places that you'll see it out there in functional programming are associated with things like uh, maps uh, and reductions on lists that here apply this function to every element of this list and produce a new list for me. Um, these things are super cool and make computing sort of fun so that you're not stuck in the for loop iteration pattern like all over uh, over the time. Uh, but more importantly, lambdas come from Alonzo Church's definition of the lambda calculus. It's an equivalent model to the Turing machine for what computing can do. So uh, the Church Turing thesis uh, states that anything a Turing machine can do can be represented by some lambda calculus expression and vice versa. So they're alternative mechanisms to think about what's possible in programming. Now, I'm sure Alonzo did not necessarily have you know, Emacs uh, hooks in mind when he came up with this calculus, but uh, that descendancy is here. And you'll see lambdas used all over the place in Lisp code and other fun functional programming languages, uh, like uh, they show up in OCaml when you're in 2041, or any of the schemes, or if you do closure programming. They pervade JavaScript. Uh, they, to some extent, are present in Python, but Guido doesn't like them very much, so I don't think they're ever really going to get, get uh, forth. And Java is so envious of them that it's uh, taking great uh, strides to try and add its project Lambda in the latest release of Java to have some sort of functional programming like that. But they are used for very mundane purposes. Uh, define a function here uh, and add that function to a list of things that are done when this thing uh, pops up. Right now, uh, if I buzz over to my uh, current sort of uh, default vanilla Emacs, if I do the control XD thing uh, to look at my home directory, you'll see all these dot files in here, dot uh, a spells and dot bashes and so forth. And those are the kinds of things that I would like to hide. So let me come back over to this dot uh, emacs file. I'm going to copy this bit of code in. And the omission of certain things that comes from a mild extension to the directory editor mode, uh, it's still built into Emacs, but you have to require it instead. Make copy of this code. 
I'm going to pop this thing uh, down here. And this little dot, dot, dot is uh, reminiscent of some other stuff that I want done but didn't have time to insert in here. Uh, so I have some uh, list code in here. Uh, one option is I save my dot emacs and then I restart emacs and see if the effect has taken change. But all of you are now smart enough to know that I don't have to restart emacs to get this to take change. What do I need to do instead? He's whispering it. Just say it out loud, sir. Yeah, just uh, eval. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, this is smart. I don't even have to like, move my finger. I just uh, eval buffer uh, and this will go. Now, there isn't a lot of feedback here right now because silence is golden. Ostensibly, this has worked out okay. If I come back over to this uh, directory editor, you'll see nothing has changed here. And that's because hooks have this nature that they only run the first time the mode is executed. And since I had this buffer open already, uh, those aren't going to take a shape. So I do need to restart this buffer, as it were, as in I'll kill it, uh, make it go away, and then I'll look again in my home directory. And voila, uh, no more dots. Uh, I see sort of clean stuff that's sort of normal. And uh, one of the other customizations is that uh, if I press the H key, it will toggle between showing those hidden files and not. Uh, and over here, as I press H, uh, voila, I have it. Uh, my little dots here, my little backup files that Emacs creates with the tildes associated with them. Uh, and if I press H again, they go away. Um, so cool little, little customizations that you can do along those lines. Um, the important thing here then is that this is code that's tailored to a specific mode and the right place to put it is in a hook for that mode. That when I'm editing an org file or a C file or a make file, I don't care about this stuff. It only takes effect when I'm editing directory images. And you'll notice the use of this local set key, which means H is only in the buffer that is editing a directory uh, bound to this uh, omission business. Feeling good so far? Okay, uh, to give you a sense, uh, there are all kinds of modes that are out there that have hooks. Uh, so for instance, C mode has a hook and it has a bunch of descendant modes. So it even has a sort of common parent hook uh, that Java inherits from and awk inherits on and all these sort of C-like languages that they'll honor the settings that are in here. I tend to prefer uh, the little slash slash here for C code uh, rather than the traditional uh, code like in x.c here. Uh, let's see, here's a bunch of stuff that we're doing 2021 kids. Uh, if I comment this right now, uh, pressing the keystroke, uh, meta semicolon, which is to plop a comma down, you'll see that the default syntax for comments, oh crap, I forgot. I, my forward is actually backwards now. This is terrible. Okay, you gotta fix that right away. So the little set key, control F to forward car. Okay, that was, that was unnerving. It's like, what's happening here? Um, so uh, this is not my preferred syntax for comments. I much prefer the little slash slash instead. Uh, so you can do things like customize that so that comments show up in a certain format that you want, uh, that your uh, indentation is only two or it's eight characters, uh, whatever your preference is there. Uh, and this would affect all of the C mode sort of uh, relatives, but not, for instance, uh, list code that I'm editing uh, right now. Making sense? All right, so modes are this you know, major way then to say, as I would edit it in C code, uh, I want to customize some aspects of that. Uh, when I want to do OCaml or shell scripting, I want to do things slightly differently on that front. Uh, and the hooks are really a good way to go about it. Just a couple notes on that. These are variables. Uh, they're essentially a list of things to do, a list of functions to run. Uh, and so as I would uh, execute uh, codes to add hooks uh, to various modes, uh, then you can add more than one. For instance, uh, the code here would add to the directory mode hook a, a little function that sets this key to be as following. And then later on, uh, there's another bit of code that's added on a separate function that will set this key uh, to be H over here. Uh, now this is interesting and slightly uh, uh, non-obvious. The reason I mentioned is I've had trouble with it uh, myself, uh, is that this guy is actually going to be the second function to run, and this later one will be the first function to run. Uh, so the first thing that will happen is this key will be set to this uh, hide and show uh, the hidden files, and then the second function will run and say, no, change the key back to uh, doing help. Uh, it's at first gas was are non-obvious like why wouldn't this go first and this go second uh, but for those of you who might be acquainted with what the LIS the list a part of list is uh, then it may become apparent like oh if this variable is associated with a, a list um, what is the ordering that these things appear in as they they're added 
Uh, and this is maybe comes back to front row, so you're smiling about it. <laughs> Yeah, there's a long tradition of if you have a singly linked Lisp, which is the primary built-in data structure in Lisp and in Emacs Lisp, the efficient place to add to it is at the head, at the front of the list. Uh, it's hard to find the tail because you have to iterate through the, all the single links associated with it. So adding this thing first means it's like the last node, uh, and then adding this thing next means this function will appear at the front of the list. And so I will evaluate when I uh, go through that list run this function, and then run this function. Uh, there are a few other built-in data structures in Emacs Lisp, like arrays, and uh, unfortunately they lack hash tables and some other modern niceties. But lots of things happen in lists uh, in it, and this leads to slight wonkiness there if you're not uh, acquainted with that aspect of it. Uh, you'll see that in other functional languages uh, like OCaml uh, and Clojure, uh, where the efficient place to add to their built-in lists is at the front, and so this leads to sort of reversals in various ways. Uh, just be aware of that. It's a, it's a reasonable thing for CS folks uh, to be aware of. Uh, Built-in doubly linked lists uh, don't show up quite as often. Usually it's uh, either singly linked lists or arrays or both uh, that a programming environment would have. Uh, and finally, if you need to reset a hook, uh, as in I got myself in a bad state like this, I just want to get rid of everything, uh, you can use the following syntax, which sets a variable, in this case the variable associated with all those things to do when directory mode uh, starts uh, to the empty list, uh, which is denoted in uh, Emacs list with this little quote, open close parenthesis. Uh, that might seem a little mysterious right now, but you'll see this set hue uh, used in quite a few spots. We've already seen it up here uh, used to set variables that are uh, relate to the minor modes uh, or aspects of the major modes uh, that we're customizing as well. It's short for set quoted uh, and will take this thing, treat it as a symbol associated with the variable, and assign this value uh, to it. All right, uh, so I think that's uh, all I have to say about hooks. Uh, any questions before we move on to slightly easier customizations, uh, which involve the, the package system? Uh, nothing here? Okay, cool. All right, all right so uh, Emacs has been described at times uh, as a great operating system that's lacking a decent text editor. Uh, and this reputation for sort of girthiness and of absorbing in a Borg-like fashion everything that appears useful uh, is underscored by the fact that in the modern era, it has a full-on package manager that it talks to servers and downloads things and maintains uh, packages and can update them and so forth. Uh, it's worthwhile just to, to look at this uh, for just a second. Um, the uh, thing I want to mention is that by default, out of the box, Emacs contacts the official GNU uh, uh, software repository for Emacs packages. And this has a really high bar to entry uh, that they do code reviews and they don't accept everybody's packages in it. And generally, if you see someone talking about a package, then you'll probably be one that's on the more popular Melpa uh, server, uh, which is just like, here's a GitHub repository, like download my code. Uh, this you know, comes with some caveats then, like may not be the highest quality uh, thing ever, but there certainly are a lot more packages on there. And so I'd suggest if you want to mess around with the package manager, you add the following two lines to your Emacs file which will add the Melpa server to the list of places that the inbuilt package manager in Emacs looks for packages. Uh, accessing it itself, and I'll take this out here and plop it down in that uh, .emacs file here. Uh, so there we have it, and then just uh, evaluate the code here and evaluate this as well. Uh, is as easy as list packages. Uh, which will pull up, and I guess they didn't actually quite uh, do it because I don't, don't see enough right now. Uh, let me yeah, kill this thing and come back to uh, .emacs. Let me try that one more. Oh, I'm being a little turd here. And this, okay, so and then list uh, packages here. Oh, yeah, good. Took a little longer, and now I see the actual archive. Um, the packages that are mentioned in here have brief descriptions over on the right-hand side. Uh, you scroll around using your sort of standard uh, by scrolling um, keys in Emacs, like Control N, although this one being sort of a read only uh, buffer, uh, just N will work as well. Uh, you can also use the interactive search to say Control S to move forwards. Uh, and I'm going to search for one of my favorite uh, um, uh, packages. You'll see down here the mini buffer is waiting for me to type things in, uh, is the Neon mode. 
uh, which is here. Uh, now, to install these things, if you want a little more information, you press enter uh, and have a look down here. Here's a mild amount of information, including the GitHub repository that it's based on. Uh, but this uh, sort of interaction follows a standard sort of paradigm that Emacs has, which is you mark things uh, by saying, I want to I for install this. Uh, and then press X uh, to execute uh, the set of deletions and installations uh, that have been marked. Uh, I'll type yes down here to go ahead and install it. And you'll see uh, something about uh, mailbox not going. That's not, not, that's not good. <laughs> um, so instead, I'll do it over here where I'm pretty sure it'll work. Uh, list packages, net neon mode. So install that thing, execute, and we're good. Oh, crap. The server might be down. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm trying to think of other. Oh, it's my wireless, isn't it? Yep. Nope. Oh, okay. I can't trust Google anymore. It's too available. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my wireless is hosed for some reason. I could re reboot if uh, you want, but I'll try toggling the wireless here. Um, it seems my. Linux laptop with its uh, strange wireless driver has been having trouble talking to the uh, campus wireless here uh, from time to time. But okay, we're good here. Good. All right. So if we come back over here, then uh, we should be able to install and execute this time. So okay, good. Uh, so you'll see that was taken off the list of packages I can install. Uh, it's down here now in the uh, spot that uh, I can delete it if I want. Uh, and I've successfully installed a package. You'll find it in your home directory in .emacs.d, uh, and I can show you that here. Uh, in the directory editor, I'll need to unhide that stuff. Here's my .emacs.d. Uh, this is a directory that Emacs uses to store a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but it'll be in this little Elpa directory down here. You'll find that Nyan mode hide down there. Uh, now, one might wonder, like, well, what did that do exactly? It downloaded a bunch of code, uh, run it uh, in, in this. Uh, the particular bit that Nyan mode does is to uh, make uh, my display just ever so slightly more colorful. That I get a little kitty down here with a rainbow. And this uh, distance from left to right is supposed to indicate the percentage uh, I am in the buffer. So if I'm way up here at the top, then the rainbow is short. And as I move down pages, uh, the rainbow gets longer along those lines. Um, so lots of fun stuff uh, that you can find in there. This one I had on for a while, but then I grew irritated uh, because uh, I can't actually see what the percentage is, and that's more important to me. So uh, I think I have it installed, but not, uh, not enabled. I might have if you want it to be enabled, uh, it, by default, as you would start up Emacs, then it's as easy as uh, coming over here to your .emacs at this point. Uh, and in here, plopping down uh, that Yen mode, and it's probably a one in order to do uh, it. It installed it, so I think if I asked about the uh, function itself, uh, if this function Yan mode, uh, it'll say, yeah, a standard like takes an argument, one to turn it on, uh, uh, negative or uh, non positive uh, to turn it off. Uh, so if I start another Emacs instance, uh, did I finish it with that? Uh, oh no, it's in desire package archives. So. And get rid of this thing quick. This guy, I'll start that Emacs one more time. No? Hmm. I might have to require package. I think that's, uh, eh, I've got too many open now. Where's the, the, yeah. Uh, let's see, is it package? Uh, yeah, I have to require package because uh, some of that stuff uh, is not known otherwise. Uh, oh, yeah, so try this one more time. And if not, if we can't get the cat to work like uh, so, so be it. Close this one. Uh, yeah, go ahead and save it. Yes, like shut those things down. And cat. Yes, cat. Okay, so that. Uh, <laughs> Um, you can see this is not exactly like the easiest uh, and leaves something to be desired if you're coming from a VS code or an Atom setting where it's just as easy usually as you know, click on something and it's installed and it automatically take effects, uh, takes effect. 
what you gain from this is a level of granularity in your control uh, that's otherwise harder to achieve. Uh, and we'll get sort of more into that in our last uh, 15 minutes uh, or so here uh, as we discuss some aspects of actual Lisp coding on that front. Uh, but that's the package manager in a nutshell. Uh, you can feel free to browse, install, delete uh, to your heart's content. Um, just installing the packages is not too bad. Figuring out how to use them properly and whether or not they'll conflict with other packages that are in the repository, uh, that does uh, take a little bit of uh, getting used to. Uh, come back over to my notes. Uh, now, <laughs> the first thing that someone asked me after our last session is how do you change the colors in Emacs? Uh, because your default, like whites uh, or black on white, is you know, nice high resolution or high contrast, but uh, programmers tend to be sort of particular about if they're going to stare at a screen all day, whether they're going to go cross-eyed like uh, staring at it. So uh, more soothing colors are, are potentially uh, desirable on that front. A recent addition to the customization systems in Emacs uh, is the theming engine, uh, which allows you to specify a bunch of colors that are then sort of honored and used throughout Emacs. This being a recent addition, like the last five years or so, uh, it's still the case that lots of older stuff doesn't really honor it as well, or it's sort of half supported. Um, so what we're about to talk about is uh, this theming engine that's probably going to get better over time, but for the moment is only sort of so-so on that front. Uh, as you would fire up Emacs here, there are a bunch of stock themes that are built into it, and also some that I have downloaded via packages that we can explore. Uh, the keystroke to know uh, is uh, load theme. <laughs> Uh, and this is an interactive command. It's going to prompt uh, and uh, for a theme name, press tab down here. Then I'll get a list of the themes that I uh, have available. I'm gonna, gonna uh, favor this wombat theme down here because uh, I, visually it isn't too bad and it's one of the actual built-in ones. Uh, uh, so uh, to that, and this will change like all the colors that are present uh, in a reasonable way. If I look at some C code, you can see uh, this has changed things slightly. I would find the underlining here to be terribly irritating, like the line I'm on is uh, a constantly underlined, uh, and it actually, uh, due to the highlighting, changes the colors of the text otherwise, and so I'd probably monkey around with that and, and change it. Uh, but this is you know, a reasonable default. Uh, there are other themes uh, as well, so you know, load uh, theme here, and uh, from this look, uh, I might try like Leuven, um, which is over here, which uh, has a, a sort of other uh, appeal to it. I have not gone through these to any great extent, and if it's not obvious, I haven't used them very much. Uh, this is in part evidenced by one of the most popular themes uh, called Solarized that you'll see elsewhere out there in the programming realm, in your VS codes, uh, in your atoms, and so forth. Uh, this one is not actually a built-in, it's a package that you have to install. Uh, it's listed under the uh, package repositories, uh, but it looks something like this, load theme, uh, solarized, uh, and uh, I think the dark theme is the one that's sort of prone. Uh, now you go down on here uh, that's um, about to run some list code, and themes generally set a whole bunch of variables. And for reasons that aren't entirely uh, clear to me, it's in this theme engine that folks start to worry about, oh, if you're about to run some list code that you may have downloaded from the internet, and this could have adverse effects of, or, or some kind. And, I don't quite understand this because everything in Emacs is running Lisp code, uh, and most of us just download stuff on the internet and like you know have at it. Uh, very few of us have had problems, but there is some sort of security warning here. Like this isn't trusted themes yet, uh, so you may want to adjust uh, or be uh, take care of that. But of course, I'm just going to you know press yes uh, to down here to um, say it and say yeah, make it safe to run uh, later on. Uh, and this maybe is the more visually appealing of uh, the, the, the stuff that we looked at. It's uh, one my brother-in-law uses in his day-to-day -day work life as a data scientist a lot because he finds it creates less eye strain uh, for him. Uh, the guys spent hours and days in even getting solarized installed on various systems so that he can just look at things in a uniform color scheme. What's bothersome about this is that since it came from the package repository, um, I haven't figured out a way to like load it on startup properly. Ostensibly, putting the following code, load theme, and for this wombat will work, in your Emacs will, as Emacs starts up, uh, load that theme. And I'll uh, demonstrate that here by jumping over to that Emacs file, and we'll put up top here, uh, load theme wombat. We shut this one down, 
uh, and start up Emacs again, uh, you'll see the Wombat color scheme might be used up here. It's fine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the if I did um, see solarized dark in this case, I'll get some errors about I, uh, this uh, couldn't be found because the directory it's located in isn't been found. And this is a good illustration of since this is code in Emacs that's to be executed, if something goes wrong with it, then you won't get very far in initialization because uh, these errors will be detected and the rest of the stuff uh, never gets evaluated along those lines. So debugging init code is uh, one of the pains that you'll all experience if you start customizing very heavily uh, using Emacs. Uh, if anyone finds a solution to this, I'm sure I and the rest of the internet would be interested. Uh, but uh, I spent about a half an hour on it and without success, uh, and I don't use it very much, so I'm not inclined to spend any more time uh, looking for a way to get Solarize there. I should probably talk to my brother-in-law about it, because I'm sure he's experienced this. Although he uses a strange variant uh, called SpaceMax, uh, which is an Emacs with a whole bunch of stuff like built on top of it to make it look cooler and run slower. So uh, to that end, uh, I, we, we talk about it sometimes since uh, it doesn't go very, very well. So uh, there is this then color theming engine, and that's probably the easiest way uh, to change colors if you're satisfied with one of the default themes uh, that are present at startup. Uh, they're easy to sort of get under the way there. And I'll comment this thing out for the moment. <clears throat> Uh, on the other hand, you can customize just about everything in Emacs, uh, including the text that you see here. Uh, to demonstrate that, I'll pull up a little bit of stuff that is maybe beyond the nail, but I'll make some notes about it uh, later. Um, this stuff up here is generally called a face. Uh, and this is, I think, before uh, I don't know, theming engines became the four. Emacs is divided on a language to say uh, certain text will be displayed having a face uh, to it. So uh, well, this face has blue and it's larger than the other stuff. Versus this is uh, more or less the default. And this being sort of uh, in between these two markers to denote code is grayed out and has a, a slightly different characteristic to it. Uh, you can ask about what face uh, you're looking at, as in what face is the cursor on right now, uh, with a uh, keystroke describe face, and this will say whatever is under the, um, the cursor right now, I'll tell you what name it is at least. Uh, and right now, since I've got this uh, global highlight mode on, this uh, um, um, sort of line that's highlighted, that always takes precedence. So in order to get this to work, I'm going to turn it off. Uh, let's see, I'm going to turn that uh, global HL line mode, I'll toggle that off, and I'll do that uh, describe face one more time. Uh, and it's saying that this is org level one because it's a heading. Uh, in org mode, it's sort of an outline heading uh, there. Press enter. Uh, then I'll get some more information about it uh, down here, uh, including, OK, this is the name of that face. Uh, it will look like this. And here are the different properties of it, including the fact that there's an inheritance hierarchy. So there's another face that this inherits from called outline one. If you wanted to customize this one face, well, there's an obvious spot to click at this point. So I customize this face. Uh, when I press Enter, I'm going to enter uh, Emacs's customization subsystem. Uh, and you'll see here then a whole bunch of stuff uh, that is uh, sort of interesting. First, the customization system is just another text bu uh, buffer, so I can move around at it uh, as such. Uh, there are sort of button-like things here uh, that, if I press Enter, will sort of execute whatever it is that is associated with the button. Uh, but most importantly right now, uh, I might want to do something down here, like insert another attribute associated with this thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, here I'm going to, let's see. Uh, oh, no, I don't want to delete this one. I want to show all attributes so I can tweak them around. Uh, for instance, the color. The color is uh, uh, probably the most important thing. Uh, it is a, both a foreground and a background color. Uh, I'll change the foreground color. So for right now, it's black, uh, which seems a little weird because it's actually shown as blue. Uh, let me change it to red instead. You can see this uh, popped up over here. And for the moment, I'm going to eliminate uh, the inheritance part of this. Uh, so it's just red. Uh, let's see. I think we're good on that front. Uh, now, a couple keystrokes. Uh, Control-C, Control-C is going to commit this for the current session. So uh, while I'm running Emacs, it will now honor this like a new setting for this thing. So I think this is where control is going to see. Okay, so you can see it's changed it up here. And if I come back to my notes.org, uh, uh, all this has changed to, to, to red instead. 
Uh, this isn't a permanent change because it's only for the present session, but it's a great way to experiment with things until you have resolved this is the part that I, I actually like. Uh, if I come back to that customization uh, buffer, uh, if I want to save this permanently, um, there are some buttons up here I can press, but this is also sort of like a text buffer, uh, the standard saving one where you press Control X, Control S, uh, will save and you'll note the message down here in the mini buffer. I wrote the changes to the .emacs file. Uh, and so as I would uh, pull up .emacs, you notice a whole bunch of stuff has been added down here, including these custom set faces, along with the list code that is representative of this is how uh, that customization is actually going to be affected, that there's uh, this list of properties and the foreground is red for it. So this is now a permanent change where I didn't really have to write any list code. I instead just interacted with this customization system, I had it do some things, and then had it write some data into the, my .emacs file that saved that change. Uh, now you have to be a little bit careful with this kind of stuff because this is sort of a, a one-off that changing the color of this one text element uh, is not likely to affect other text elements. We saw that there's some notion of an outline mode. I didn't affect that one, so this will only be this one kind of stuff. And I've gotten into trouble where like, oh, I changed the text color here, and then I get to some other file that's sort of related, but not quite, like change it in C, but it doesn't stick in Java. Uh, and so this can be a little bit hit and miss to customize it in this way. Probably it's better off to maybe look at the themes and then tailor those just a little bit if you're concerned about that. Uh, but this thing is fairly deep and robust and just about everything that's going to have a different display associated with it is going to have some little face uh, that's described there that you can tweak and mess around with if you're so inclined. And really, that's all what those uh, color themes are, uh, is uh, a collection of here are the faces that Emacs will display and here are the settings associated with those uh, arranged in some same pattern. Uh, this is not hard to tweak yourself and so if you're so inclined you can actually define your own themes mostly by copying other people's, uh, uh, but uh, here's the theme that I tend to favor. It's this black with some yellowy stuff, and all it really is, here are the list of faces, uh, like uh, org mode faces and org table faces, uh, and how big to make things and what color to trim them as you go through. Uh, so if you, as you get into it, this isn't a hard thing to customize either. It's just a bunch of uh, list code as well along those lines. So that's about all I'm going to say about colors because I find them infuriating. Uh, and I'm sure you will too, but if you get things set reasonably well uh, and move on, there's a lot more code to write uh, than there is uh, colors to tweak, so don't get lost in that rabbit hole. Good so far? All right. Uh, so we've talked then a little bit about the customization system, uh, and I should really, hmm. Uh, I should really restore this because now, are you happy with the red, red headings? Like those will be okay for now? Yeah, okay, you're good. Uh, the customization system uh, is used not just for colors, but for just about everything. And so what we were seeing before in terms of set the C comment character to be this and set the indentation level about to be this many spaces and so forth, that can be reached uh, through customization and those set of customization buffers as well. If you want to start at the top, then it's just meta x customize. Uh, which will give you uh, a sort of long litany of different groups of things that you might uh, want to play around with. For instance, the programming stuff. Uh, in here will be some tools and some languages. In the languages will be all the sorts of stuff you'd expect. Uh, there's your C. If I look for Java, uh, there's JavaScript. And oh yeah, Java isn't special enough to get its own uh, the set of customizations. It's inheriting from C instead. About Lisp and Lua and Octave and Pascal and uh, Perl and so forth, they all have entries in here. If you dive down in these, uh, then you'll see there's usually a group associated with these, which you can reach immediately by customizing that group, as in uh, customize group. And if I picked uh, C instead, uh, then this would get me the C group of stuff. And all this is is a bunch of settings and variables uh, associated with programming tasks that involve Lisp or C or whatever else. Uh, for instance, somewhere in here is indentation stuff. Uh, it's four right now. So as I would go to my uh, .emacs file, uh, and I would, for instance, start defining a function, if on uh, f to be something, uh, the indentation level by default is four here. Uh, if I type some stuff uh, like forward car, uh, and I'll stay at four level four the entire time, backwards car, 
Uh, and if I change this over here to two instead, set the settings uh, for the current uh, session, uh, and press tab to re-indent this stuff, then it'll move back to two. Uh, so this is another spot then that you can make changes and make tweaks uh, to, to Emacs as uh, you work through it. It's a little bit more palatable, but eventually results in just some list code. In this case, uh, that was added down here, or would be added down here to the .emacs file uh, if I reloaded it. So let me reload that to see. Oops, here, yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, and if I wanted to save this permanently, uh, then you see up here someplace that, uh, let's see if I can find, uh, this will be lisp body indent, lisp body indent. Uh, there's a setting in here now that's two, but that I have to worry about what code to run for this. It was done by virtue of setting the thing in the little customization buffer instead. Um, you can spend lots of time on this, but I would encourage you focus on the things you do more. If you're writing C code, then customize the crap out of the C mode. Uh, if you're writing Java, then customize the crap out of the C mode because that's where the Java mode uh, comes from. Uh, and if you're writing other things, then probably tailor your modes, your key bindings, et cetera, uh, to those tasks themselves. Good so far? All right. Now, uh, I want to say before we uh, end tonight, just a few words about Lisp and Emacs Lisp uh, in its sort of own right. Um, it's an old language. Uh, what's that? Just, uh, these are the, I know the XKCD comic. So oh, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Okay, so sorry. Uh, Lisp is a really old language. Uh, I once was got into an argument with my PhD boss. He's like, you know, I don't know why you're writing some of your PhD code in Lisp. Like it's not as fast to see, and it's a relatively new language that no one understands. And I just stopped and I crossed my arms, which I'd never done for my PhD boss before. I mean, this is the person that holds six to ten years of your life in the palm of their hand and can crush you with a word. But I crossed my arms and he's like, "It is not a new language. It is like the oldest working language that was in use." And I was wrong, of course, because it's actually Fortran. Because some people actually still use Fortran. Uh, but aside from Fortran, Lisp is the oldest one that still sees common use out there. And it's arguable whether like the Lisp of the 1960s and 70s is really in use because it's a far cry from your schemes and your closures uh, that are more popular these days. Uh, but Emacs being a 40-year-old program that still uses Lisp, I think is a sort of valid argument on that front that uh, when uh, uh, Brian Koenig and Dennis Ritchie were still twinkles in the, their father's eyes before they were born to, to create C, um, there was this Lisp business, and it has a timeless quality to it. That's expressed in this uh, XKZ comic uh, that uh, you were mentioning. Uh, jump over to the web browser. Um, this one is, is worth considering because it riffs on several aspects of nerd culture. Uh, these are your father's parentheses, elegant weapons for a more civilized age. Hopefully all of you have seen you know, A New Hope, the original like, Star Wars movie, uh, and so you get the reference there, but um, I, I think it's apropos at, at any rate. And the comment is that, God, there are a lot of parentheses that are in Lisp, as it were. Uh, let's see, MIT community, oh, never mind. Like I said, it's more obscure references. Um, so what you'll see in terms of Lisp code is lots of stuff that looks like this, uh, that there's some sort of an operator in front, and then a bunch of arguments uh, that are given to that operator. And then there will tend to be nesting of these things. Uh, for instance, uh, this might be op2 with arg1. Uh, so this first parenthesized expression is evaluated and passed as the first argument to this thing. Uh, and this one is like an if uh, this thing is true uh, x, uh, then it'll be arg1 in the true case and arg3 in the false case. So now I have argument one is this op, and argument two is this other thing that's the res coming out of this if statement, uh, and this whole thing is fed to the, the first operator. Uh, and it starts to make you appreciate why Emacs has really good built-in support for navigating between parenthesized expressions uh, quickly, uh, that you can start in the middle and go upwards and outwards uh, and forwards over them and so forth, because it was built to work with list code, it runs on list code, and so it better support uh, list code editing uh, as you go through. Uh, let me just restore this quickly to the original uh, part of this. Um, so I'll mention that this operator that's mentioned here is sometimes a function, and it's sometimes a so-called special form. 
And these are what you think of as syntactic elements in other languages, like an if uh, clause uh, to say, here's something special, but we're actually going to suspend evaluation until we decide this thing is true. In that case, I'll do the first thing, uh, and otherwise, I'll do the second thing. Uh, Lisp is very syntax free, uh, and this unnerves people a lot. They're like, well, what should I write? I mean, I'm used to writing lots of curly braces and semicolons and uh, fours with complex expressions with in i's in between it. Uh, and in terms of actual code, like there isn't much syntax. There are a bunch of parentheses and a uh, smattering of special words they have to learn. Uh, aside from that, then you actually have to focus on your problem, which is very unnerving to most folks because uh, they don't want to think about their problem. They want to think about uh, curly braces and parentheses and stuff that they write down. Uh, since there's so little to write in Lisp, uh, it gets you to your working on your problem faster in that respect. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, more uh, in, um, uh, as we actually look at some Lisp code. Uh, it's worth mentioning that um, Emacs itself originated in part from MIT, and for a long time their programming one class was taught in Scheme, uh, a, a dialect of Lisp that's slightly more modern and slightly more sane. Uh, it was just believed that programmers, as they get started, should be exposed to these higher principles, the lambda calculus and the true nature of computation and what it can be. Um, everyone, everyone hated it, but since uh, University of Minnesota was like, oh, MIT's doing it, oh, we should think about this. Like, uh, yeah, okay, we'll do it too. Uh, we, for a long time, taught our 1901 Programming One course in Scheme as well, and everybody here hated it. Uh, so eventually, when MIT decided, you know, there's something behind this whole Python business, uh, maybe we should look into that. Uh, they changed, and about two years later, University of Minnesota also changed uh, to, to Python for their programming one course. So. Uh, and many folks in our department, and probably at MIT as well, lamented the fact that there are these things that beginning programmers don't get to hear about, like lambdas and so forth. So our solution is to have like 2041, where we study OCaml, another fine functional programming language, um, to take its place. Uh, but it's worth it, if you want to be a serious programmer, to have some Lisp under your belt because it gives you a different way to look at programs and is oftentimes much more pleasant. Uh, our more immediate cause is it's gonna let you tweak Emacs even further by introducing new functionality that isn't just rebinding keys or setting up color schemes, it's instead actual new, new stuff. So I wanna walk through just a couple of sort of interesting functions that are worthwhile uh, to define and then I'll take questions if there are any, uh, doubtful at this point. Uh, but your basic sort of um, function in Emacs, as you define it, uh, will usually start it with a, a defun, uh, which is short for define a function. And what you'll see then is a name for the function, uh, and usually an open close parenthesis. Uh, if it's just that, then the function takes no arguments. If there's something in here, like arg1, arg2, then this would take uh, two arguments. And you can name those whatever you want, like uh, x and y, if you're so inclined. Uh, generally, the functions I write to customize Emacs, they don't involve a lot of arguments, and so I won't uh, bother with that one. Uh, the first string that shows up, uh, which is usually right afterwards, is a documentation string. And it's what's going to be shown if someone asks for help on this function. Uh, and this is really useful because right there, built into the function definitions, is a way to integrate with the self-documenting parts of Emacs. All those major modes that define this is what to do in C, this is what to do when you're working with make files, this is what to do when you're editing directories, they follow a format like this. And so when I type uh, help on a function like uh, forwards character, if I were to look at the code associated with forward character, if it wasn't actually written in C source, uh, then I'd see this is where that documentation string comes from. It's right there with the function instead. Uh, the next statement oftentimes is to make it an interactive function, and this allows you to type meta x like do something, uh, and in a moment we'll do that with this hello world. So it makes available then uh, for zero arguments uh, to do whatever this function is supposed to do. And then you have actual Lisp code. Uh, that it's uh, not obvious like what exactly you can do in Emacs. You'd have to study a manual stating here are all the built-in Lisp functions in Emacs to move the cursor around, uh, to uh, manipulate strings in various ways, to save a cursor position while you do something and then restore it for the user. Uh, but generally then, this is the part where code goes. Uh, you notice this opens with a parenthesis for the defun, uh, and the matching parenthesis down here uh, is the end of that function. So uh, aside from these two special parts, the rest of this is just code that the function's gonna do when it's executed. Uh, to demonstrate this one, uh, let me pull it over here uh, into our 
Uh, so that, actually, let's get rid of this guy. I think we can just do it in here instead. Uh, let's see, I'll put it in the scratch buffer because uh, this is a common place. Oh, I even have it out there already. Um, uh, this is a common place where, uh, by default, Scratch is set up uh, in Emacs. It's the first open buffer, and it's set up to do lispy kinds of things. Uh, so if I plot my cursor over this thing and press that uh, set of keystrokes that we learned earlier to evaluate it, in this case, control uh, uh, meta x, uh, this will evaluate. And there's now a function in the world called hello world. Uh, if I do the meta x thing, say hello world to run it, uh, then I see a little message down here, uh, hello world, uh, that's mentioned in this little echo uh, buffer along those lines. Uh, I can bind this to some key if I like. Uh, for instance, uh, let's do global set key uh, control x h. I don't know what I'm losing here. I will say hello world, and I even get tab completion now because this is now a defined function. Uh, so if I type control x h, uh, I get my little hello world message down there repeatedly. <laughs> Feeling good so far? I mean, so that little bit is uh, fairly straightforward. The syntax feels odd for those coming from Pythons and Javas and Cs and so forth. It even comes odd, uh, seems odd for the syntax-rich OCamelers out there. Uh, but this is a working function right now, and it's integrated to Emacs. I can even ask about help. Uh, for instance, give me help on the hello world function, uh, tab completed. Uh, and here is, uh, say, hello world. Oh, that's that string that I've uh, pumped in here. So uh, having this in my .emacs file would mean every time I start Emacs, like this function is available to me. Not particularly useful, but gives you a sense of the possibilities of how easy, how low the bar is to add extensions to Emacs of, of, uh, of your own making. Good so far? Questions or concerns? Yes, yeah, sir. What does the interactive do? Yeah, so this makes it available as an interactive function uh, that I can, it makes it easier to bind keys to it. And it also means that I can do the meta x with this little thing down here and just type hello uh, world like that. Now, if I take this out and uh, well, let me just rename this to goodbye world, I'll take out the interactive, uh, take, change this thing and goodbye here like this. Uh, so uh, if I, Execute this code now. It's still define a function. You get a little feedback here, like this is the name of the function that was defined. But I cannot ex uh, execute it as a so-called command or interactive uh, that function. So down here, if I try goodbye world, I get no matches. If I type it in myself, I'll just say there's, there's nothing to, to do at that point. What I can do uh, is run this as list code. So if I say fire up the little list buffer here, evaluate this, and do the goodbye world uh, down here, and it'll still execute the same thing, putting a message more or less uh, down here. Down there. Um, so there's a, a mild distinction in Emacs between what's a user level interactive command, which is a function that's marked as interactive, and what's meant to be more an internally used function to support something else's. And here's this one user level command that I'm going to provide. But I need a bunch of helper functions, so to not pollute the namespace too badly, I'll make those just standard functions, non-interactive, and call them with arguments uh, to accomplish my larger task. It's not exactly private, because I can still like run it uh, by uh, down here uh, typing in the list node. And there isn't really any protection mechanisms along those ways. Uh, but it is less obvious then, so a user will be less likely to stumble on it inadvertently. Does that answer your question, Rizmo? Yeah. OK, cool. There are a bunch of other cool things you can do with this interactive. It takes arguments. If, for instance, your function, you want to put a little prompt up here and get some information from a user, like what file to open or what symbol to operate on, uh, then interactive can actually do that for you. It has this weird sort of esoteric thing. And if you wanted help on that, uh, it's as easy as, uh, OK, control uh, H, and then the function, uh, and ask about what interactive does. And here's all the documentation about what interactive does on that front, so making it easy to figure out how could I extend this thing uh, to do exactly what I want. Uh, that goes true, uh, 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 true for just about anything you see up here. For instance, if you wanted help on the defund syntax, uh, control H, and then uh, it's a function. The suggestion here, since the cursor's on it, is defund. I can also type it, like a defund down here. Uh, and this will give you how it is that the function syntax is defined in Lisp. Uh, and if I wanted some help on what this message uh, built-in function in Emacs is, uh, control H, F to ask for help on a function 
uh, and then type message, uh, and this will pop up, uh, here's the documentation associated with message. So this being sort of a self-contained system makes it easy to quickly check information about, I wonder if there is a, a function that is this, or I'm looking at this list code that someone else wrote, like what does this function do? Uh, if you're looking at it in Emacs, then you can very quickly call up documentation associated with it. Make sense? Cool. All right, uh, the last thing then we'll do is to look quickly at a somewhat more complex function. Uh, I have to say it's my favorite one that I've ever written because I use it every, every day. Uh, and the problem is as follows. Uh, Emacs has this nice shell thing that we uh, uh, talked about a moment ago, uh, that if you do the interactive meta x shell, uh, then this will either pop open an existing shell buffer uh, that's uh, mentioned down here, uh, or if there's not one uh, running right now, it will fire one up. So if I type meta uh, x shell here, uh, it will fire one up and you'll notice here the directory that I'm in corresponds to the directory of the, fi uh, the file that I typed shell in. So uh, right now is in this uh, home Kaufman tool time on the lectures directory and that's where the shell starts by default. I find this to be terribly useful because it's very often in the middle of teaching class, we'll look at some code and we'll want to compile that code. And so I'll want to jump a shell immediately to that directory uh, and do some GCCing and then some A.outing outing to sort of demonstrate here's what the code does as we run it. Let's make some changes, jump back over to the shell and, and I'm a monkey around with it. What I find irritating is that uh, if I already have a shell open uh, and if I'm in deep in, for instance, the 2021 directory in the lectures, uh, and I'm looking at this introductory code here, uh, and I type, like, oh, this is the code I want to look at, this uh, scanf demo, uh, and if I'm over here in this code and I type shell, uh, then where I end up is wherever that shell was to begin with, uh, as in, uh, this is not where I want it to be at all, uh, it's still over in the tool time lecture stuff. And in order to navigate it over here, then there's a long sort of, well, I can copy this thing and paste a CD over here, or I could kill the shell and then restart it over here to say, okay, now it's fresh and now it's in the right directory. But this whole thing was sort of cumbersome and, and irritating. So what I really wanted for was a way to quickly say, here's a file. If the shell is already open, change to the directory that this file's in. And if the shell's not open, like create it and jump uh, to the directory that this thing is in. Uh, so this all just leverages a few things that are built into Emacs, along with a little bit of a conditional structure to check the shell's open, do this. If it's not open, like do this instead. Uh, in the meantime, I have to figure out the Emacs interface to say, how do I figure out what directory this file is in? Uh, so let me pull up the code for that and we can walk through it uh, together for just a moment. <laughs> Uh, to give you a sense of uh, the possibilities here. Uh, so first off, up top is this little defun uh, with a long ass name and you can see the convention in Emacs and in list in general is to name things using dashes. Uh, I don't know if that was because uh, they didn't like subtraction or something or just that you know, naming things with um, camel case only came in fashion later, like uh, you know, naming like this that became popular as Java and C++ took on. Uh, and naming things in C involves uh, holding shift and pressing the dash uh, to put an underscore in there. So Lispers are like, I haven't got time for any of that. I'm just going to name things with dashes. And so the symbol names that are present in uh, Lisp will involve lots of dashes, and they're considered sort of a printing character as, as part of symbols that, that we'd use over there. Uh, you'll notice I have a documentation string up here. Uh, I've declared this thing as interactive, and then things get just a little bit nutty as you move on from that. Um, one of the common forms that you'll see in Lisp syntax is a let binding. And if you've taken OCaml before, this is the way you declare variables, it's uh, with let. But here, the, due to impatience from Lispers as well, a let binding actually uh, allows you to declare a whole bunch of variables in one gasp. Uh, so the first parenthesis here says what follows is a list of pairs of name and value, name and value, name and value. The values over here are produced by evaluating more Lisp code. So uh, the directory in this case is defined by saying if I'm in a major mode, that's a directory, uh, then it's the directory that's at the point. Otherwise, uh, it's whatever the default directory associated with this file is. Now, how you would come to know any of these things and why I picked these particularly was just over time. Like initially, I was probably just had default directory, but then realized later, oh, if I'm in directory editor mode, like there's some special rules there, so I'd want a little condition here. 
You'll notice keyword equal here. That's how you compare things properly. Uh, and here I'm looking at a defined variable for major mode. Uh, this is a variable that has a value. If it happens to be the symbol, then it's directory editor mode. Otherwise, something else. I can ask about variables, like uh, for instance, by saying here uh, in this uh, uh, current buffer, uh, control HV will ask about a variable. And if I ask about the major mode, uh, it'll say your major mode right now is org mode because this is uh, an org mode buffer. Although I'm looking at Emacs Lisp code that's in the context of this organization and note taking uh, bit of business. Um, so discovering then what variables are uh, available to you, that's half the fun of, of this business. Uh, the next binding is to rebind dir uh, to be something else uh, where I'll just do some string replacement because there's a bunch of slashes in there. And then finally, I want uh, some commands to be a concatenation of cd, that's a change directory to dir. So at this point, I'll have commands being something like change drive to uh, home Kaufman 2021 lecture 01 or something like that uh, to indicate like this is a command I want to send to the shell at some place. Um, the common sort of paradigm is define all your variables and then do things with them uh, in your uh, standard Lisp setup. Uh, so you'll see another special form here, uh, when. Uh, this is uh, action-oriented, sort of like an if, except it usually has a single clause. If I've only got one window open, uh, then split it left and right. Uh, uh, but if I have two windows open, uh, I'm going to do something with the other uh, window. Uh, then to check to see if there's a buffer that exists that's called shell, uh, then do the following stuff. Uh, but if that buffer doesn't exist, uh, this will return a falsy kind of value, so I'll do the alternative down here. And here's where you'll see the very uh, syntaxless nature of Lisp. The if statement is like, here's the condition, here's the form that's associated with what to do if it's true, and here's the form associated with what to do if it's false, all sort of bundled in this uh, little uh, if uh, bit of business. So get buffer is a built-in. It just looks around for something that's named the following, returns it if it's present, and returns uh, nil or the falsy value if it's not. And the little prog end thing is sequencing, as in do this and do this in the true case, uh, do this and then do this uh, in the false case. Uh, after uh, this if executes, I'll have an open shell and my uh, pointer by the little uh, cursor here that'll be in that shell buffer. Uh, Command end of buffer uh, moves to the end of the buffer. Insert will type some text, and here's where that command comes in uh, handy. Uh, this will insert whatever that CD to the desired directory is. And then the last thing is to tell the shell this input is ready, so please execute it. Uh, when all is said and done, then, uh, I bind this to control C J uh, because uh, I like the jumping to a particular buffer. And the net effect is uh, as I type control C uh, J here, uh, this will open up something over here that's changed to the proper directory that's associated with it. Uh, if instead I was on that uh, C code that we were looking at uh, earlier, if uh, I already have a shell open over here, if I type control C uh, J, uh, that jumps me back over uh, to this thing. Uh, so this was, I don't know, it took you know, maybe an hour or so to write the first time, and then I've added little things to it about directory editor mode and so forth as I've gone on. Uh, but this one makes my day-to-day -day life like super easy because as I teach 2021, close down my laptop, uh, try to take a short nap, and then come back to 4061, uh, I forget to change the shell over to, like, to the directory that's associated. As you open up examples, this is an easy way to just control J over there, uh, and you're good to go. So that, in a nutshell, uh, is a crash course on some Emacs Lisp that you might uh, be interested in. Uh, this code I'll make available as part of the notes for today. Uh, but if any of you have any questions at this point, that's about all I got. So now would be the time to ask. All right. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thanks again to Joe for bearing with me through his sickness. Uh, and if anyone's interested, a couple weeks from now, we'll have another session, but we'll beyond, uh, be beyond Emacs at that point. We'll be talking about some of the Unix command line tools like grep and sed and cat and awk and so forth. Uh, so come back then if you're curious about those things. Thanks all. <laughs>